Hello, my name is Danny Stuckel. I'm a museum educator who works for the State Historical Society of North Dakota. I'm also the state coordinator for the National History Day in North Dakota program. You might be wondering, what is National History Day? I like to tell people new to the program that it's a little bit like a science fair. Students work on a large research project and present their work to a team of three judges. Students in grades six through eight can enter the junior division and students in grades nine through 12 can enter the senior division. Students can work individually or in groups of up to five students, although many teachers put additional constraints on group size. For example, only allowing two or three students in a group. Students participating in the contest submit projects in one of five categories, documentary, website, exhibit, paper, or performance. The most important thing to know about National History Day though, is that while competing in the contest can be a lot of fun, that's not our ultimate goal. As a historian and museum educator, I want to see the NHD model incorporated into all classrooms, regardless of whether students participate in the contest or not. As a working historian, I know the frustration that both students and educators feel when a history class feels like it's only focused on memorizing a bunch of facts that don't feel relevant to our daily lives. Historical thinking does not equal memorization. That's where the, the NHD model can rescue a boring history class. Teachers who have incorporated this approach like how this is project-based learning that, be, that brings inquiry right into their classrooms. History and language arts teachers appreciate the focus on reading, writing, and research and media literacy. National History Day teach, teaches historical thinking skills and supports collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. Students appreciate the opportunity to have greater influence over their own learning. They like being able to share something they are personally interested in that might not otherwise be taught in class, and they really enjoy the creative outlet in their final product, a documentary, a website, an exhibit, a performance, or a historic paper. What kind of topics can students use in a History Day project? There is literally a universe out there of potential topics. My personal pet peeve is to hear people complain about how they never learned about something in school. Historians and educators have worked together for decades to identify the basic ideas and concepts students should understand as they go out into the workforce or off to college. Every object has a history. Every person, every moment in time, everything. His historiography is the study of the ways we have interpreted history over time. It is the history of history. Everything has a history, including the study of history. Even ideas and concepts have a history. What is the history of love? Why do some cultures have arranged marriages and others don't? What is the history of sound? What did a ringing telephone sound like a hundred years ago? For many of us today, our phones don't ring at all. They vibrate in our pockets or are set to silence so they don't embarrass us in an important meeting. What is the history of smell? What would your community have smelled like a hundred years ago? For a lot of us, it would have smelled like horse apples. I once lived near an ethanol plant at, and at certain points in the production cycle, our whole town smelled like baking bread. As we study history, we use three types of sources. Primary sources are what I like to call the good stuff. This is all the evidence that eyewitnesses to history have left behind for us to study. The letters, diaries, photos, newspaper articles, and other sources of information. Secondary sources are the work of historians. 
These are the history books and museum exhibits that interpret the short and long-term impacts of the people, ideas, and events of the past. They analyze why these subjects still have meaning for us today. The third type of source is called a tertiary source. These are sources that provide overviews of a topic. They focus on facts and tend to have little to no historical analysis. These are things like Wikipedia, encyclopedias, dictionaries, almanacs, reviews of books and movies, and textbooks. These sources are typically not cited in a bibliography, but are very helpful as students get started with their research into a topic. Textbooks, as tertiary sources, are introductory texts into a historical topic and are by design what we like to call an inch deep and a mile wide. They seldom take a deep dive into any one subject. Significant historical ideas, events, and people tend to only have a few paragraphs or even only a few sentences written about them in a textbook. For most students, the only sources they've really been exposed to in any real way yet are, the, are these tertiary sources. Think of this as if the only thing you know about cake was the existence of vanilla cupcakes. I love a good vanilla cupcake myself, but the comparison as a historian is not being aware of all the rich primary and secondary sources out there. It's as if students are living in a world in which Martha Stewart, the Great British Baking Show, and the Food Network don't exist. This is the rich world historians work in as we utilize primary and secondary resources and build our projects around all of these wonderful photos, diaries, letters, newspapers, books, oral history interviews, historic moving image formats, and other formats of eyewitness accounts. One of the first elements of National History Day that your students will need to understand is the annual theme. Students can feel frustrated by the need to connect their project to the, to the contest theme. However, the theme serves an important purpose by providing a framework by which to evaluate the diverse projects and topics students bring to the contest each year. By design, themes are very broad. This makes it easier for students to find ways to connect their topics to the theme. While the theme might not be a formal requirement, projects that clearly incorporate, clearly incorporate it tend to do well in the contest, and it is something judges specifically look for. It is important to remember that while most of our judges are enthusiastic history supporters, they are not necessarily professional historians themselves. Even when professional historians are part of a judging team, it's unlikely they're an expert on the diverse number of topics seen in a random, in an average History Day contest. The students themselves are the experts on their topics, generally having done more research in that area than any of the judges they will talk to. The theme for the 2022 contest is debate and diplomacy in history, successes, failures, and consequences. Students, parents, and their teachers can learn more about the annual theme on the national contest page at nhd.org theme. At this page, you'll find the theme book, which can be downloaded as a PDF file for free, You'll also find a graphic organizer students can use to connect their topic to the theme and a series of short videos that further aid students in understanding how to work with this year's theme. The next element NHD students will encounter in this process is topic selection. These five keys are important when selecting a History Day theme. First of all, it should actually be history. That means it probably needs to be an event that is at least 20 years old or older. This is so there has been enough time for us to analyze the short and long-term impacts of the topic and that there is plenty of primary and secondary source material to be found to support your research. It needs to be significant and fit the annual theme 
Ask yourself, so what? Why is this important? Why would or should anyone care about this topic? Most importantly, make sure it is something you are genuinely interested in. At a minimum, you'll be working on this project for several weeks. Some students end up spending months reading about their topics, especially if they go on to compete in the state and national contests. Try to find a topic you think you'll still be enthused about next June. When students are looking for topic ideas, we often do encourage them to start with current events. What stories from the day's news cycle are the ones you want to learn more about? What stories are the ones you find yourself getting emotional about? Maybe they make you sad or happy or angry. They are the stories you want to tell your friends and family about. What are the things you are learning about either in or out of school that you'd like to learn more about? What are your personal hobbies and interests? What would you like to share with your classmates about the history of an extracurricular activity? If you're still stuck, get together with friends and classmates to do a brainstorming session and just throw out lots of ideas. Do a sprint by putting two minutes on a timer and have all the participants ping pong back and forth to list as many possible ideas as they can before the timer goes off. One of the biggest challenges every student will face is the process they will go through to narrow their topic down from the overall theme to their specific thesis statement. Think of this process as forcing your topic through a funnel. This process will help you set the overall scope and other constraints on your research. In this example, we're going to pick women's history as our topic. Well, there's thousands of years of women's history that could potentially relate to the annual theme of debate and diplomacy. How are you going to narrow this broad topic into a final product if you only have about 10 minutes to share your work with your audience? That's a lot of potential history to cover. Now we've chosen to research women's voting rights specifically. But this is still too broad. Women's voting rights where? Women in the US? Women in Great Britain? Women in one of the other 195 countries in the world? How about women when? Women in 1976, 1876, or 1776? We need to further narrow the scope of our project. Now we're getting somewhere. We've tightened this down to focus specifically on the 19th Amendment. This gives us a narrower scope for our research. We know we're, we're looking specifically at US history. It does also narrow our time frame down a lot too. However, we could still be talking about a number of different decades when you consider that we could focus on the time leading up to the passing of the 19th Amendment, the timeline immediately before and after the passing of the amendment, or the decades after the amendment was passed. Now we really start to dig into our topic and explore secondary and primary sources. Before we can develop a specific thesis statement, we need to first start asking some questions that we hope our research will answer. What are we curious about related to the 19th Amendment? Did the 19th Amendment really accomplish what supporters said it would? Did it go far enough to guarantee all American women the right to vote? Are there examples we can find where the voting rights of certain groups continue to be limited or restricted? Good historical research questions ask why. They are narrow enough to focus on a single issue and they frame an argument. The answers to good research questions tend to be more analytical than descriptive. They explain the so what about history. As you continue to do research, you will want to reevaluate your research question periodically. You might need to change it depending on what kind of evidence your so sources do or do not provide. 
Finally, we have a thesis statement. Our thesis statements do a lot of work for us in historical writing and tend to be a bit longer. While your thesis statement for an English class might only be one sentence, in historical writing it might actually be two or three sentences. This particular thesis statement reads, Though the 19th Amendment ended debate on women's voting rights, some white activists and politicians used it to further limit and exclude black men and women from voting. I have highlighted the word debate to draw your attention to how we have connected our topic to the annual theme. Also, this statement is clearly an argument. Other students could argue with this statement and have a different interpretation altogether. You will probably revise your thesis statement several times during the course of your research. Think of doing research and developing your thesis as peeling an onion, peeling away all the layers to get at the historical core in the middle. As you develop your project, don't forget to look for ways to connect the micro to the macro and vice versa. If you are studying world history, ask yourself how this topic affected your local community. If you're studying U.S. or local history, ask yourself how people and events in your town had an impact on the world stage. For example, did the events of World War II impact your local community? Did the people of your community play a role in the overall story of World War II? Students are often surprised to find out how much research they will need to do for their project. Remember the maple syrup rule. It takes 40 gallons of tree sap boiled down over the course of many days to get just one gallon of maple syrup. Similarly, students should plan to spend significantly more time on research than they do creating their final project. They will likely find that their choice of category may change as they do their research as some topics lend themselves better to some categories. A lot of teachers have all students write a paper for grading purposes, while other teachers allow students to choose any category. Some teachers limit the category their students can choose to do a project in for various reasons. For example, some teachers decide to not allow students to participate in the website or documentary categories due to the lack of available de devices like laptops and tablets for each student. While most students will include descriptive text in their project, the who, the what, the when, and the where of history, to provide context, the focus of text should always be on answering the how, the why, and the so what of history. Let's look at these examples about George Washington which sentence is descriptive and which provides an analysis. George Washington was unusually tall. The general stood six feet two at a time when the average continental soldier stood about five foot eight. Versus Washington's height, six inches taller than the soldiers he commanded, was an important part of his mystique. He towered over the soldiers. His men looked up to him, literally as well as figuratively. The first sentence is descriptive, while the second sentence provides some analysis that another student could interpret differently. Here's another example. Which of these sentences would you consider to be more descriptive, and which would you consider to be more analytical? The United States dropped the second atomic device on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The bomb was carried by a B-29 bomber, the Enola Gay. The blast killed about 80,000 Japanese in the city. Nine days after the bombing, Japan agreed to surrender terms. Versus, though Japan surrendered 10 days after the bombing of Hiroshima, Ending the war quickly was not the Americans' only goal in using the atomic bomb. 
they also wanted to show Stalin that they had successfully built such a weapon to demonstrate its massive destructive power and to show their willingness to use it. The first sentence is descriptive, while the second sentence includes analysis. Ideally, students will include both description and analysis in their projects. The description helps to provide context, while the analysis tells us why, why this topic matters. You can see from the highlighted portions of this text that, that both students and their audience have a clear roadmap to follow as to where this project is going. The three highlighted claims are also our argument stems that students will need to defend in the body of their paper with evidence from pri primary sources. What historians and educators want students to learn through this process is how to formulate and organize a historical argument and defend that argument with evidence. They also need to learn how to analyze that evidence, the primary sources through techniques including close reading, corroboration, contextualization, and sourcing, or understanding the intended purpose in a document, a photograph, or other primary source. You can get a really good idea of what this looks like from this historical thinking skills chart from Stanford History Education Group. Visit their website at sheg.stanford.edu for this and other great classroom resources. One of the things History Day judges are specifically looking for that can be confusing to students is student voice, or what historians call historical interpretation. To understand what we mean by interpretation, take a look at this image. What words would you use to describe what you're looking at? Did you say this is a hand or an arm? Did you say this is up or somebody pointing up? Or maybe you said number one. All of these responses would be a potentially accurate or correct interpretation of this image. Maybe you even wondered if this was a gesture that has meaning in American Sign Language. That's an interesting potential meaning, but upon further analysis, we would probably not find anything to corroborate that hypothesis. The act of interpretation is to explain the meaning of something. History is, by its very nature, subjective. To be clear, we are not simply looking for students' opinions. We are looking for them to conduct analysis that reflects their perspective, their point of view, their frame of reference, or their worldview. Historians are not journalists reporting on the who, what, when, and where of a topic. Historians interpret the why, the how, and the so what of why history matters. As you do your research, it is critical that you consider multiple perspectives in your work. This does not mean that you're necessarily giving equal weight and legitimacy to both sides of an issue, especially if we now consider one or more sides of an issue to be morally reprehensible, like slavery or the Holocaust. Also, any particular issue has as many perspectives as there are people. Considering multiple perspectives does not mean we simply include the perspectives of three people and that has met our goal. Think of the Supreme Court issuing dissenting opinions or the arguments in a debate class. They are perspectives with noticeable and significant ideological differences. They are perspe perspectives that people can and do argue about. You need to understand why some Germans supported the Nazi party, but you do not have to defend the Holocaust. You have to be able to explain why some white Southerners supported the Confederacy, but you do not have to justify slavery. 
Remember when you're doing your research that tertiary sources are a good tool for when you're, for when you're just getting started. However, they are not scholarly sources and you typically will not be citing them in your paper. Your research should probably be a combination of in-person and online activity. Most organizations only have a small percentage of their collections online, which means you are missing out on a wealth of material if you only use online sources. A cultural heritage organization is any organization that has a collection of some sort and makes that collection available to the public through publications, programs, and for research. Libraries tend to have books that you can check out, Archives tend to have what we call manuscript collections that include things like photos, letters, diaries, and so forth. And museums tend to have three-dimensional objects. However, all of these organizations tend to have a lot of overlap in what they collect, and you are likely to find books, manuscripts, and objects at any library, archive, or museum. These are the biggies. Definitely explore these resources as you do your research. The Library of Cong Congress, Chronicling America. Chronic Chronicling America is a website within the Library of Congress's suite of websites, and it's focused on providing access to historic newspapers. Using inquiry with Library of Congress resources is also a really helpful teaching tool. The National Archives at archives.gov and a subset website within their suite of websites is docsteach.org. Those are also very valuable res resources as you and your students do your research. This is a short list of some of the amazing library, archive, and museum resources in North Dakota. The State Historical Society of North Dakota has a number of very significant statewide resources available to students, both online and in person at the archives. Pro tip, visit our YouTube page for our Archives in Action playlist, where students can see what our archives actually look like and how our archivists do their job and how people come into our archives and do research. But we also have a website page for our state museum at the Heritage Center. We have website pages for all of our state historical sites. Across the state of North Dakota, we have nearly 60 historic sites, several which have interpretive centers of their own that students can use in their research and their projects. And we have the North Dakota Studies materials, which provide a number of great resources as well for students. The North Dakota State Library is located next to the Heritage Center on the North Dakota State Capitol grounds in Bismarck. And a lot of people aren't aware that the State Library will send books to anyone in the state that has a State Library card. Students should also know about asking their librarians about interlibrary loans for access to books that they might not otherwise know about. All of the universities in the state, especially NDSU and UND, have research libraries and they appreciate and um, are excited and enthusiastic about students who come to them to do research. They are very helpful resources and are open to students looking for more information about uh, not just the state of North Dakota, but all resources for world history. Thank you for watching this video about how to bring National History Day in North Dakota to your classroom. I am the state coordinator for National History Day in North Dakota, and I can be reached at dlstuckel at nd.gov or 701-328-2794, and I'm happy to answer questions that students, parents, or teachers might have about how to do History Day at their local level. Thank you.